Lecture 12. We're going to continue with our discussion of gases and the respiratory system. And you just have to remember which button to push. So, all of the gases in air, mostly nitrogen and oxygen, produce at sea level a pressure of a 760 millimeters of mercury. Each of those gases, oxygen, nitrogen, contribute to that 760. The amount they contribute is a function of their percentage. So we say that each gas contributes a partial pressure. To determine the partial pressure of a gas, we multiply the total pressure of all gases times the percentage. You all know that 21%, if you express it as a decimal, is 0.21. To determine the partial pressure of oxygen, we multiply 760 by 0.21. That comes up with roughly 150 millimeters of mercury as the partial pressure of O2. We refer to that as the PO2, or partial pressure of O2, in millimeters of mercury. We can use PO2 as a measure of the amount of oxygen that's present. But there is another component that determines the total amount, and that is solubility. So look, consider the solubility of gas in air and in water. So this should say, I think this is a misprint in your notes. One, I have to find the... Uh, doesn't, oh, right there. There we go. And I'm just bringing this image up right here. This shows a beaker with a gas interface and a with, with a water or fluid. When you bring, if, if, if the fluid is, has no oxygen in it and you expose it to an air environment, oxygen molecules will dissolve into the water based on its solubility. At equilibrium, the partial pressures are identical. So this would be the PO2 in air would be 150. The PO2 in the water would also be 50. But the amount, the number of molecules is going to be substantially different. And we might express that as volumes or volumes percent. In air, a PO2 of 150 gives you 21 mils of air per, I'm sorry, mils of oxygen per 100 mils of air. That's where that 21% comes from. So consider a graduated cylinder. 21 mils out of 100 would be oxygen. In water, because the solubility is so low, you have less than one mil of oxygen per hundred mils of water. This is precisely why we would have a great difficulty breathing water. Now I know, um, I know that it worked in Water World. 
We have gills, but it doesn't work for humans because there's just, this is great for fish, carp, goldfish. None of them, to my knowledge, are, are uh, well, I know they don't have prehensile thumbs, but they're not particularly bright animals. They don't need a lot of oxygen to drive their system. So one of the great things in evolution was this movement onto land and this ability to take advantage of this incredibly rich oxygen environment. So same partial pressures, substantially different amounts of oxygen present. This is exactly what is faced by the system, by the, the respiratory and cardiovascular system. You have oxygen in air that's being brought in. It must dissolve into the fluid interface in the alveoli. It must diffuse into the liquid interface in the interstitium. It must diffuse into the liquid of the vascular system and into the, into the blood. And you just can't get much oxygen. So before we talk about how we, how, we, uh, how we deal with that, the movement of oxygen is based on pressure or concentration differences. Oxygen moves from a high pressure to a low pressure, a high PO2 to a low PO2. So diffusion, we have no active pumping of the oxygen across the alveoli. So Everything has to be by diffusion. What we want to do is we want to maximize that diffusion. And how do we do that? One of the ways is by having a very large surface area. You want to increase the amount of material diffusion, increase the surface area over which it can diffuse. Enter the alveoli. If you were to take all the alveoli and flatten them out, it would be something on the order of 70 square meters, something akin to the size of a tennis court. That's a huge volume. That's a huge surface area for exchange. One of the problems in emphysema is a loss of those alveoli and a, and a collapse of the alveoli, alveoli reducing the surface area. Emphysetics have difficulty breathing. Why? They have reduced surface area for diffusion. In order for them to provide the same amount of oxygen, they have to breathe with more force. They have to increase the ventilation. Another element that influences the diffusion is thickness. If you want a substance to diffuse, you want it to diffuse over a limited distance, particularly in water. Here's the gas interface. Here's the alveoli. There's some liquid right there. The interstitial space, the red blood cells. The distance from the red blood cells and the blood to the alveoli is exceedingly thin. You've reduced that surface area. What happens if fluid comes into the interstitium? We already talked about that the cardiovascular system. There was interstitial edema. You can get that in the lungs. In that case, it's called interstitial pneumonia. An increased fluid accumulation in these interstices. So you actually have done two things. One is you've increased the, the distance across which the gas must diffuse. And you've also put in that nasty substance, water. Water which has an exceedingly low solubility for O2. So what are you going to see in an, in an individual with interstitial pneumonia? They are having difficulty getting oxygen into the blood. Their ventilatory efforts are exaggerated. They have to increase minute volume. They increase frequency. They increase tidal volume. Another way of influencing oxygen gradients 
So this is a this is a on the bottom of plate 52 you have oxygen gradients. It shows a value of 105. These are PO2s, right? Oxygen gradients. 105, 100 in the arteries, 40 in the capillaries, 40 in the interstitial fluid, 15 in the cytosol, and 5 to 2 in the mitochondria. It's not important that you remember all of these numbers, just to know that oxygen has to flow, it has to diffuse based on these gradients. One of the ways you can increase oxygen delivery is to increase this number. Well, where did that 105 come from? Air, we said, is about 160. Here's 152 millimeters of mercury PO2. These, this represents the inspired PO2. Inspired PCO2 is 0.03%. So you have to add two zeros. If you multiply 0 0.0003 times 760, you get a pretty small number. So essentially, there's no CO2 in the inspired environment. 152 millimeters PO2. Now what happens is, as this air comes in, water vapor is added to it. That is a, another gas, another gas which contributes a partial pressure, which will in fact exclude other oxygen and nitrogen molecules. So by the presence of having water in the environment, water vapor, you are going to reduce PO2. Secondly, you have this huge anatomic dead space. Almost uh, a third of the volume is going to be tied up in this anatomic dead space. So when you ventilate, you don't get total removal of CO2, nor do you get total reintroduction of pure oxygen. The consequence is that the partial pressure of O2 in the lungs, in the, in the alveoli, is only about 100 millimeters of mercury. This diffuses into the capillaries in the pulmonic circulation. It's taken to the left heart, circulates to the, to the levels of these, the cells. And at the cells, take me out for a second if you would. At the cells, they're metabolizing. These cells are consuming oxygen, so PO2 drops. The cells at the same time are producing CO2. Look at that, 46 millimeters of mercury CO2. Less than one in the external environment. Gases exchange. When, when, when the blood leaves the cells, it'll be Okay. Are we good? All right. So, 105 coming around the horn when it leaves 40. 46 CO2. So, a very CO2 enriched environment. Oxygen has been pulled out. At the lungs, there's that exchange, and it's expired because at 32 pCO2 and 40 O2. The CO2 will become an important component in terms of acid base. I've told you that breathing, up, breathing water is not a way to go if you're a uh, aerobic creature. So how do we increase the amount of oxygen which is carried? And that we rely on hemoglobin. So on plate 53, there is a representation of a, a system without hemoglobin. So here's a fluid 
water-like substance. In this case, we're going to talk about plasma. Notice they've used 100 mils of plasma. So we can talk about volumes per cent. So if you take normal air and you allow it to come into equilibrium, you will see that at equilibrium, they will have both the air and the, and the plasma will have the same partial pressure, but because the solubility of oxygen is so low in plasma, there is less than one mil of oxygen dissolved, so it's 0.3 volumes per cent. Not enough to support an aerobic organiz organism. The response to that is to produce a molecule which will bind oxygen enter hemoglobin. Hemoglobin consists of a heme or iron containing group and there are four binding sites, four uh, irons, so you can bind four oxygen molecules to each molecule of hemoglobin. You take hemoglobin, you package it into red blood cells, you then transport it around the circulatory system and in a normal human it's something on the order of like 18 grams of hemoglobin per 100 mils. I don't remember the exact number. But the bottom line is for humans with a normal complement of red cells, you go from 0 0.3 mils of oxygen to 20 mils of oxygen, like a two, magnitude, two orders of magnitude increase. So the way that vertebrates have solved this is by the introduction of this hemoglobin molecule. 99% of the oxygen is transported in the bound to, to hemoglobin. Maybe 1% of that dissolved in the plasma. We talk about oxygen being bound to hemoglobin. We talk about oxygen being dissolved. When a molecule is dissolved, it is hydrated, meaning it has water molecules surrounding it. It hasn't been converted chemically to a compound. It is, in fact, still a gas molecule. It's just hydrated. When oxygen binds to hemoglobin, it is not a covalent bind. It binds to the iron, so it's not altered. The structure of oxygen is not altered. It is merely kept with the hemoglobin molecule. But that molecule is not dissolved. So we talk about oxygen molecules in a dissolved state being in equilibrium with the oxygen bound to hemoglobin. If I decrease the amount of oxygen dissolved, that's going to pull the reaction in this direction. Conversely, if I increase the oxygen dissolved, that will tend to drive oxygen onto the hemoglobin molecules. This is an equilibrium setting. What about transport of CO2? Oxygen, critically important molecule. You do not have adequate amounts of oxygen, you die. You have too much amount of CO2, you die. There is a, there's carbon dioxide narcosis. It is recognized by the, the AVMA as an appropriate euthanasia compound. So you die from not getting enough oxygen. You can also die from too much CO2. CO2 transport is critically important. How is it transported? 70% of the CO2 is transported in the form of bicarbonate. So you have to re you have to learn a little math or a little chemistry. CO2 combines with water to form carbonic acid H2CO3. That's not dissolved CO2. CO2 that's dissolved in gas is a CO2 molecule which is surrounded by waters. This CO2 molecule is bound covalently in the form of this acid. 
this acid which is relatively unstable and breaks down to form hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. Sixty-seven percent of the CO2 is carried in this form. Nine percent is carried dissolved. So in fact, CO2 does dissolve. Nine percent compared to one percent O2. It tells you a little bit about the solubility. Solubility of CO2 in water is 20 times that of oxygen. Twenty-four percent is carried as carbaminohemoglobin. That is bound to hemoglobin. Oxygen binds to the iron, to the heme sites. CO2 binds to amino groups on the protein moiety of the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin serves both as an important transporter for oxygen and also for CO2. A quarter of the CO2 is carried bound to hemoglobin. Um, ideal oxygen storage molecule because hemoglobin binds to oxygen in the lungs, it transports it to the tissue, and it gives it up. Uh, I don't want you to, you don't have to be concerned about the alpha and the beta peptide chains. You just need to know there are four heme groups. You should be familiar with the term porphyrin. Uh, heme group is sequestered in the, uh, heme group is sequestered in the porphyrin, and it's a very convoluted, relatively large molecule. What I want you to focus more in on is how it binds. So for that, we go to plate 54. The graph in the upper right on plate, four, on, on plate 54 shows the, the chemical binding of oxygen and hemoglobin. And if I can get it. To show, there we go. So here's the binding, or what is in your text referred to as saturation. Think of a hemoglobin molecule, one hemoglobin molecule that has all four irons bound. We would say that that hemoglobin molecule is 100% saturated. If there are no oxygen molecules present, then that hemoglobin is desaturated, or it has 0% saturation. The shape of this binding or dissociation curve defines the chemical characteristics of this hemoglobin molecule, and it is, in fact, sigmoidal, which means that there is over a range of oxygen concentrations, rapid binding, rapid release of O2. This is a plot of percent saturation versus the amount of oxygen. It's nice, your, your text has kind of diagrammed, here's 105, so this is, this is what's, what's going into the alveoli. In the resting state, the PO2 is 40, so the example on the, on the previous page, or the, the two plates before, had shown a PO2 leaving of 40. Look at what happens to the amount of hemoglobin binding. It's nearly 100% saturated at rest with 100 millimeters of mercury. Hemoglobin leaving the tissues in a non-exercise state is around 40. That is, it's only been reduced, the saturation has only been reduced by about 25%. So in fact, this blood, the 
has oxygen pulled out of it, is still 75% saturated. What that means is you have a tremendous capacity to draw on those reserves when you might need it. So here is the exercising individual. During exercise, oxygen is consumed at a greater rate by the muscle. The resultant is that PO2 drops. So blood coming back from working muscle, and in some cases, muscle can extract all of the oxygen. You have this capacity then to release this oxygen. And because of the sigmoidal shape, the ability to dump oxygen with low PO2 occurs very, very rapidly. Contrast that with myoglobin. Myoglobin is like hemoglobin. It has an iron-containing heme group. But there's only one of them. Look at the binding curve for myoglobin. This is the same graph O2 saturation or percent saturation as a function of the partial pressures. Same units as over here, 105 millimeters of mercury. This curve right here represents the binding for hemoglobin. This curve to the left represents the binding curve for myoglobin. Instead of being sigmoidal, it's hyperbolic. So there's a large range of PO2s in which myoglobin is, remains saturated. And it only starts giving up oxygen molecules at relatively low O2s. So here at 40, myoglobin is pretty much saturated. Well, where does myoglobin sit? Myoglobin sits in the muscle. Here's my red blood cell with hemoglobin. And consider these two proteins in contest or in competition for oxygen molecules. At a PO2 of 40, hemoglobin gives up about 25% of its oxygen. Myoglobin, much higher affinity. That is, it tends to be totally saturated. So as the hemoglobin molecule comes into the muscle, it, it, the myoglobin is able to take up oxygen and aid in the diffusion. This becomes even more pronounced during exercise. So see what happens during exercise is even more oxygen is given up. The myoglobin curve sits to the left, meaning it has higher affinity. So again, during exercise, as, as the hemoglobin enters this low PO2 muscle environment, it is willing to give up its oxygen molecule to the myoglobin. Myoglobin facilitates then in that diffusion of oxygen from the red blood cell into the working muscle. We can use those different relationships with an individual hemoglobin molecule. And that's represented by the curves in the lower figure. So here is a plot of percent saturation versus partial pressure of O2. Here's a normal binding curve for hemoglobin. This curve over here could represent myoglobin or it could represent hemoglobin without an organophosphate called DPG. DPG or diphosphoglycerate is a normal occurring glycolytic intermediate in a metabolizing red blood cell. If there is no DPG, what happens is the hemoglobin shifts to the left. It increases its affinity.
blood which is stored for long periods of time reduces its concentrations of DPG. This is the underlying reason for discarding old blood and the continual need for new donors. If you took a bottle of blood off the shelf that had no DPG and you added it into the body, what would it do? At normal PO2s, it would be 100% saturated. At rest, it would still be pretty close to 100% saturated. During exercise, it would be pretty close to saturated. That is, it has such a high affinity that it would not give up its oxygen molecule. It wouldn't give its oxygen molecule up to working muscle. wouldn't give its oxygen molecule up to a working brain. These individuals, hemoglobin, 100% saturated, nice and red, but it's not delivering any O2 to the tissues. So in fact, giving old blood with no DBG to, to a, uh, uh, to a uh, patient that needs oxygen, kiss of death. So we need to have these organic phosphates. Elevations in the organic phosphate so, a decrease in DPG shifts the curve to the left. It increases its affinity. An increase in DPG shifts the curve to the right. Increased metabolism increases DPG. Increased metabolism also increases CO2 levels. It also increases hydrogen ions. So, all three of these components produce a right shift in the hemoglobin binding curve a decrease in affinity. So picture this hemoglobin molecule entering the lungs, picking up oxygen, going to the tissue. Same hemoglobin molecule now get exposed to higher levels of DPG, higher levels of CO2, and higher levels of hydrogen ions. Everything being equal, the curve shifts to the right, meaning that that affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen is decreased. The consequence is that it is easier for this hemoglobin molecule to give up an oxygen, exactly what you want it to do in working muscle. So here's the hemoglobin now that's coming out. For any given PO2, So at this PO2, here's the percent saturation for normal hemoglobin. Here's the percent saturation for hemoglobin that's exposed to this DPG and CO2 and hydrogen ion. So everything else being equal, this hemoglobin molecule that's been exposed to these metabolites just can't hold on to its oxygen. What happens in the lung? Just the opposite. In the lungs, CO2 is given off, DPG give, decreased. The curve shifts then not to the right, but it shifts to the left. That increases the affinity. So for the same PO2, a hemoglobin in the lungs binds oxygen better. So this change in affinity is very important in modulating oxygen release and oxygen uptake. Oxygen release of the tissues, oxygen uptake at the lungs. Little fetus drawn right here, little pregnant woman right here, to represent two different types of hemoglobin, one found in the maternal source and a different, genetically different hemoglobin in the fetus. Fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity than maternal hemoglobin. So if you take a red blood cell with fetal hemoglobin and you put it next to a red blood cell with maternal hemoglobin, this hemoglobin molecule has a higher affinity for oxygen. So here's an oxygen molecule in competition. Who's going to win out? It's going to go to the molecule with higher affinity. Exactly what you'd want to do in a placental circulation. 
No lungs. Lungs are non-functional in the fetus. It's getting all its oxygen through maternal blood supply, through the placenta. So by having this higher affinity, you are selecting for oxygen to move into the fetus. Transport of CO2, H2, and bicarbonate. So some of this is going to be reviewed. This is plate 55. It's going to be plate 55. I scroll too fast on this. It uh, smears it. All right. Internal respiration. So this is at the level of the cell. O2 is being consumed. CO2 is being produced. Oxygen is coming from the oxygen bound to hemoglobin. In fact, what you don't see in this state is the presence of myoglobin. Myoglobin will pick up this oxygen, help to take it into the mitochondria. CO2 is being produced. It diffuses out. How is it carried? Bicarbonate, dissolved, and as carb amino. This oxygen molecule becomes deoxygenated. Now, that may be only 25%, maybe 75%. Coming out of some muscles, it may be 100% deoxygenated. That process is one that you can visualize because of a color change. Oxygenated hemoglobin, red, deoxygenated blue or cyan. Venous blood supply back to the lungs where just the opposite occurs. The hemoglobin molecule picks up oxygen, becomes saturated, and then goes back into the arterial supply. CO2 is given off, coming from the bicarbonate and from the carb amino. This hydrogen ion plays an important role in acid base status. I should probably do this this right at the other way. CO2 plus water goes to hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. The addition of CO2 into a aqueous setting is an acid. So when you drink those carbonated beverages, you get sparkling water. One of the taste sensations that you're going through is a sharp acid, what you might call a sprightly taste. What happens if you leave the bottle uncorked? CO2 goes into the atmosphere. 
it diffuses. It's in high concentrations in the sparkling bottle, it diffuses into the air. The reaction is pulled in this direction. Hydrogen ions decrease, and you perceive it as a flat taste. Flat taste because it's more alkaline. So CO2 plays an important role in maintaining acid base. And we regulate hydrogen ions. An acidic environment is bad. We talked about lactic acid disrupting the sarcolemma, altering enzyme activities. So too much acid is a bad thing. Too little acid is also problematic because we regulate our acid base balance. If I ask you to hyperventilate, that is your ventilation does not match your metabolism. Your ventilation exceeds the normal CO2 production. What you are doing when you hyperventilate is getting rid of CO2 at a rate greater than you should. The net effect is that you are becoming alkalotic. That is a respiratory alkalosis. And you know that it's a problem because you start buzzing. So there's influence on neural function. And a lot of what we're going to do is regulate CO2 because it's importance. And we'll talk about that next time.